Okay, so in the last session, we looked at Edward's definitions. Uh, you had ultimate and subordinate end, ultimate being something you value in and of itself, chief and inferior end, chief being the one that you value the most, and original and consequential, original being what you value prior to any consideration of circumstances. And we're looking for the ultimate end that's also the chief end, that's also an original end, or the original, originally most valuable end. That's what we're looking for. We also talked about four assumptions Edward makes. Now, uh, Edwards believes that if you start with his assumptions, these four that I've mentioned, that God is eternally and unchangeably happy, that creation is from nothing, ex nihilo, that God has an end in creation, and that God operates according to, not underneath, but according to the principle of proportionate God. If you, if you adopt those four assumptions, then Edwards believes you must give his answer to the question. Like you, in other words, you give him those four, he's got you. And the rest of the treatise is him trying to work out step by logical step the implications of embracing those four truths, which I think are just basic to the Christian view of the world. Do we believe that God has an end in creation? Is God self-sufficient? Does he create from nothing? And does he value things according to their value? If you say yes to those four, Edward's just gonna say, if you're going to be consistent, you must give the same answer that I give to this question. Why did God create the world? So now we'll begin to look through how he goes about his reasoning. I mentioned before that he has kind of these six dictates of reason. There are six steps in an argument. And from these six steps, he kind of groups a couple of them together so that we end up with these four criteria. That's why it's a simpler thing to talk about the four criteria than to get lost in the dictates. So four criteria. And I've said before, think of these as qualifications for the job of being God's original ultimate end. So he's saying, all right, we're looking for this this original ultimate end, most valuable before creation, all that kind of stuff. Well, what, what must it be? How, how do we know if we found it? What are these, what are, we, what are the job qualifications? And he's going to start saying, well, it must be this, and it must be this, and it must be that, and it must be that. And if we, if it meets these four, we found it. That's how we know. And he's going to argue for each of these criteria. So what are they? Number one, God's end, meaning his original ultimate end, cannot imply any lack in God. Now, that candidate right there rules out most things, right? Because now any answer you give about why did God create the world because he was lonely, well, that rules it out, okay? And you can see how this one's rooted in his assumption. If God is eternally happy, then no answer that we give can imply that there's a lack in him, okay? So this is it's really basic. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it. It's just a real basic qualification. Any answer to this question, why did God to make the world, that implies he's lacking in something. He's needy. He has a psychological need, emotional need, a moral need, a, a physical need, any kind of need that you can think of. If the answer you give means God was needy, it's wrong. It doesn't work. And, it kind of, and so right from the get-go, he's kind of just kind of wiped the table with any, most answers that people give to this question. So that's criteria number one. Criteria number two. This one's a little bit more complicated, and you'll hear again those assumptions kind of lurking in the background, because this is how we find those assumptions. He's walking through these criteria, and lurking in the background, you can detect, ah, oh, there's an assumption. What is it? And I've named it earlier. So what's criteria two? God's end must be inherently most valuable, meaning objectively speaking, it's the most valuable. It must be valued as such by God before creation, subjectively. So it is valuable, and he values it before creation. And here's the important thing. It must be attainable by creation. Now, why does that matter so much? Well, because there's things that might be valuable, most valuable even, and that might be valued by God before creation that he can't attain through creating. You're going, wait, what would that be? Well, think about it. Think about God's existence. Is God's existence most valuable? Well, yeah, he's God. Does he value it before creation? Well, sure, because he's always existed. Is God's existence attainable through creation? And you go, well, no. God doesn't create in order to exist. It doesn't make any sense to talk that way. It's because he exists that he can then create, but his existence is prior to creation and is not attainable. So you just ruled something out. We know that God did not create the world in order to exist because his existence is not attainable by creation. Creation presupposes his existence. 
okay? So he's ruling things out as he's doing. He mentions that one in particular. He also mentions God's attributes. Does God create in order to be holy or in order to be just or in order to be faithful? No, he's always been faithful. He's always been just. He's always been holy. Creation doesn't accomplish those things. It doesn't attain those things for him. Those are the prerequisites in order for him to create. So again, we've ruled something out. The end for which God created the world is not his own attributes. Their existence, their, their, their isness. That's not why he made the world. It must be something else. It must be attainable by creation if it's to be the end for which God created the world. Criteria number three, God's end must manifest God's supreme regard for himself. I mentioned this a sec earlier in the earlier session about God's holiness, okay? That God's, what, is, what does Edward say God's holiness is? It's his valuing things according to their value, which means he values himself infinitely more than he values anything else because he's worth infinitely more than anything else. So if you put, uh, if you put God on one side of the scale, it's a scale here, okay? And you put creation on the other. If it's heavy, it's gonna sink. Which one's gonna sink? This one is, like a rock. It's just gonna, it's not even gonna be close. This over here is just dust. In fact, that's the way Isaiah talks. It's just dust on the scales. They're regarded by him as less than nothing. That's how, value, that's how much it's worth in and of itself. And what Edward says, therefore, if God, if that's how much they weigh, if God weighs infinite and creation weighs nothing because it's based on nothing, then for God to be holy means he values himself infinitely above everything else. Which means whatever God does in creating, whatever end he has in view, he must maintain his holiness. He must continue to be holy, which means God's end must manifest or express his supreme regard for himself. If it doesn't, if the end for which God created the world doesn't display his supreme regard for himself, it's not the end for which God created the world. Again, another, another so now you see what you begin to have, you have a list. And you can say, here's an answer. How does it stack up? Does it meet qualification one? Does it meet qualification two? Does it meet qualification three? And if any of them it fails, throw it out. It's wrong, it can't be right. So that's, that's criteria number three. In fact, Edwards, just to stick with this God and creation deal for a minute, Edwards asked uh, this question here. Um, take that scale again, put God on one side of it, and on the other side, put God plus creation. And he wants to know which one's heavier. Which one's heavier? Well, the answer to that, you might think, well, feels like this side would be heavier. Both of them have God, and then this one has a little bit more because it's got creation. And this is Edward's way of exposing whether you really believe that creation is from nothing. Because the answer to that question is neither one is heavier. They balance each other perfectly. This is worth infinite, and this is worth infinite plus zero. Therefore, they balance perfectly. It's Edward's way of exposing, do you think that you have anything, that you're worth anything autonomously, independently from God? So, criteria number three, it must manifest God's supreme regard for himself. And then criteria number four, God's end must be a discernible consequence of creation, evident in his word and his works. In other words, whatever we're looking for needs to be something that once he's created, we can look at and point at and say, there it is, we see it. He's accomplishing it. Why? Because God is sovereign and doesn't fail in his purposes. Therefore, if he intends to do something through the creation of the world, if he has an end, you ought to be able to point at it and say, there it is. It's happening. That's how, we, how, we, how do we know that that's what he aimed at? Because we see it evident in what he does and what he says. So now we have four criteria. Okay? It can imply a lack in God. It, uh, it must be originally most valuable prior to creation, and God must value it that way. It must be attainable by creation. It must manifest his supreme love for himself. It must manifest his holiness, his love for himself. And it must be a discernible, evident, obvious uh, consequence of creation that we can see in what he says and what he does. Now, can we find anything that meets that? Are, 
are there things in the world that we can point to and say, there it is? That moves us into the candidates. So again, I said before, you had four assumptions. Now we've had four job qualifications. Now what do you, what do you go do? Once you have job qualifications, what do you do? You go headhunting. Let's go find some candidates. Let's go find some, some people. Let's throw them up there. He's already ruled some out. Can't be his existence. Can't be his perfections. It can't be anything that would mean that he's needy. So what's left? Well, Edwards offers four candidates for the job of being God's end in creation. And he starts by saying, here's four things that meet criteria two. It's most valuable, valued by God before, and attainable. And criteria four, it's evident in his word and works. So let's just start with two qualifications and whittle it down to those. What does he come up with? Candidate number one. The demonstration of God's perfections and attributes. Now this is different. Earlier I said it wasn't his perfections. By which I meant the existence of his perfections. Whether he has them. This takes a step beyond. This is the expression of them. The demonstration of them. The display of his attributes and his glorious perfections. Well let's think about it. First, let's think about what, what do we even mean by that. What is an attribute? Okay. And Edwards drills into this pretty deliberately. What is, what, is, what is an attribute of God? What do we mean by that phrase? Well, he says an attribute, this is his language, a sufficiency to certain acts and effects. And you think, that doesn't help me. That, just, that made it more complicated, not less. Well, let's break it down. You really, again, a lot of this stuff, it's complicated words, relatively simple concepts once you get them. Okay, what's an attribute? A sufficiency. What is, another word for sufficiency would be capability, a capacity, an ability, something like that. Okay? It's an ability to do certain acts or effects. That's what an attribute is. Okay, I think I get that a little bit. Well, what's the demonstration of an attribute? Well, it's when that ability, sufficiency, is exerted, like it works, it does what it's supposed to do, in the production of effects that then display the attribute. Four steps, right? You've got, a, you've got an ability, you do something that produces something that shows something, and you've demonstrated an attribute. You're going, still not clicking, still not clicking. I get it, I get it. Doesn't click with me either. Here's how to click. Isaiah 40, 26. Actually, let's wait for Isaiah. I'll give you a, a simpler, more mundane example. Imagine I've got a, a vase right here up on this podium, and this podium is slanted so you can see where this is going. There's a nice vase. Now let's say this vase has an attribute. That attribute we call fragility. It's fragile, okay? What do we mean by saying it's fragile? It's just sitting there on the, on the uh, podium here. Well, we mean that it has a sufficiency. It has an ability. What is the special ability that this vase has? It has the ability to break. It's a very special vase that has an ability to break like that. Well, what does that mean? Well, you've got, so let's just say, uh, let me ask the question. It's sitting here on the podium. It's fragile. Is it fragile right now when it's sitting there? Yeah. It possesses the capacity, the sufficiency to break. But it's not broken. Well, what would demonstrate that capacity? Well, just let it sit on this slanted podium long enough, and it's probably going to go, think, and right off. And what's going to happen when it goes off? It's going to fall through the air, and it's going to hit the floor. And when it hits the floor, it's go that attribute is going to exert itself. Okay? So back to here. The sufficiency is exerted. When that vase falls, it has the attribute. It has a sufficiency. It hits the ground, and that, that attribute is exerted. It, it does what that attribute was meant to do. And it, what does it do? It produces certain effects. Like what? Like shattered pieces of vase on the floor. And then you come along, you walk in here with me standing with a broken vase all scattered on the floor, and you say, oh, I see, the vase is fragile. And I say, how did you see that? Well, I looked at the production, the, the product, the effects, and I looked at the breaking, the exertion. And I looked at the exertion, and I looked at the effects, and I said, ah, in that exertion and in those effects, I see something about the vase. I see an attribute. I see that it's fragile. So now, all of a sudden, you go, oh, that makes a little more sin. That's an attribute. Now, the thing is, is he's saying God has these attributes. He knows he has these attributes as perfectly before as after. And yet, the exertion of the attributes in appropriate effects is something that is valuable to God because the attributes themselves are valuable to God. Right? I'll give you another example. An artist. 
he has this attribute called creativity. So what does he do? He takes his paintbrush and he begins to paint a picture. What's that? He's exerting his attribute of creativity. What does he produce after that exertion? A painting, a portrait. That painting and portrait is the product. The exertion is his actual painting of it. And then you come along afterward and you see him painting and you see the portrait and you say, ah, now I see. Now that attribute has been displayed, demonstrated, manifested. Or, here's the text again. Isaiah 40, 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Okay, see. Something's going to be displayed. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Now work through this and think by that same paradigm. You look up at the night sky. Every night, the stars come out. What is that? That's an exertion of power on God's part. He's got power. He has it. A sufficiency to certain acts and effects. He has that ability. Every night, the stars come out. He calls them by name whatever stars' names are, right? Orion, come on out. And there comes Orion. And then you look up at the night sky and you see the exertion, they're coming out, and you see the product, the blanket of stars in the sky, and you say, oh, now I see. I lifted up my eyes on high and I see. What do you see? His might, his power. Otherwise, his power would have been invisible to you. How could you have seen it? Unless you looked at the exertion and the effects. So this is something now, now here's the question you have to ask. Well, that's the, that's the candidate. So let's ask, is the demonstration of attributes most valuable prior to creation? Well, it's God's attributes. They're infinite we're talking about here. So if he's uh, before creation here, and we're trying to find something that exists back here that he can delight in, back when it's just him, but that's also attainable and a consequence of creation so that it shows up over on the other side as well, does demonstration of attributes qualify? And the answer Edwards gives is yes. Because over here, does God love his attributes? Yes, he does. He thinks they're infinitely valuable. His power, his might, uh, his holiness, his, his love, his faithfulness. He values those things in themselves. And there, because he values those attributes, he also values their demonstration. He wants to see them go public. Right? He wants to display them. He values the display because he values the attribute. Now, is the demonstration of attributes something that's attainable by creation? Sure. He can demonstrate his, at, his attributes by exerting in certain effects. Sure he can. Is it an actual consequence of creation? Well, sure. Isaiah 40 just said it was. It said, look up at the heavens, see his power. And you go, How? I'm seeing power by looking at stars. I'm looking at effects and seeing a manifestation of something that's invisible. In fact, we see this exactly in Romans 1. This is the huge sin of man, right? Romans 1 says, his invisible power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. Like we see them and we just say, don't want to see it anymore. I'm not going to honor you as God or give thanks. I'm just going to turn away. But it says we clearly see it because God has made it known to us. We see his invisible attributes invisible things. So we have a candidate. This is great. The demonstration of God's perfections and attributes, the display of his attributes. But Edward isn't done. He says that's one candidate. Here's another though. If God's displaying, who's he displaying to? Who's going to see? Who's going to look up and see? And he says, well, if it's a thing in itself valuable and worthy to be desired that these glorious perfections be actually expressed and exhibited in their correspondent effects, like if, if that's good that God do that, go public with these attributes, then it seems that the knowledge of these perfections and the expressions and discoveries that are made of them is a thing valuable in itself absolutely considered. And it's desirable that this knowledge should exist. So think about it. If there's a display, there ought to be a receiver, someone to see it. If God's displaying, Shouldn't there be someone on the receiving end to go, oh, now I see power, knowledge of attributes? And Edward says, yes, that seems like it's something, again, that God would love back here that actually shows up over here, right? Something that God loves here, knowledge of his attributes, would show up over here? Yeah, so it meets our criteria again. 
And then he says, oh, but that's, that's not it. That's not the end. We need another candidate. It's not enough that people know them with their minds. We need them to love what they know. If it's a thing valuable and desirable that God's glory should be seen and known with the mind, so when known, it seems equally reasonable and fit, it should be valued and esteemed, loved and delighted in, answerably to its dignity. If the idea of God's perfection in the understanding, that's the mind, is valuable, then the love of the heart seems to be more especially valuable, as moral beauty especially consists in the disposition and affection of the heart. So it's not enough that you look up and go, oh, I see power, cool. Stars, I see power. So there's stars that display. There's you that look up and see. There also needs to be love, delight, amazing, right? It's not enough to know with the mind. We also have to have affections and delight and value and esteem with our hearts. Now we have, and so again, is that something that God would love back here? Before creation? Sure. Is it something that actually shows up as a result of creation? Yep. So now we have three candidates. Display, knowledge with the mind, love with the heart. But we're still not done. We have a fourth candidate. And this is where we start getting crazy. The communication and emanation of God's internal fullness at extra. And you go, okay, break that down. Communication and emanation, those are synonyms for Edwards here. So he's got to communicate, it's gotta, which means applies again, something going out and something being received. Emanation, overflow, right? If something emanates out, it's like a fountain that overflows of God's internal fullness. So God is, has internal fullness and then that needs to go add extra. And that just means outside. <laughs> and that's the best you can do when you're talking about God because if you actually start to, the reason that's important is you start to think about like, okay, if you've got God, where exactly is outside? if he's everywhere, right? Like, there's nothing out there. There's just him. So uh, theologians came up with this little Latin phrase, ad extra, and said at, outside of himself. That's about the best you can do. As opposed to ad intra, which would be inside of himself. So, it's, so what's the candidate? Well, what would be something that exists back here that's the result, that is the attainable and is a consequence of creation, but God loves it back here and it comes to exist here? Well, if everything that's inside here were to sort of overflow outside and show up over here, God would love that. God would delight in that. That would be valuable to him. It would be originally most valuable to him. So here's what Edward says. As there is an infinite fullness of all possible good in God, a fullness of every perfection, of all excellency and beauty, and of infinite happiness. So God has that. It's a fullness of all possible good. So every, just, that's about the best you can do, right? Like just the fullness of good. Every good thing, every good nest that you can imagine, the good that makes good things good, all of that in him. And he has every perfection, all excellency, all beauty, infinite happiness. He's got that inside. And as that, we're going to call it fullness from here on out, that fullness is capable of communication or emanation ad extra. So if it's capable of coming out, it seems a thing amiable, valuable in itself, that it should be communicated, that this fountain of good should send forth streams, that this fountain of life should, diffusing its excellent fullness, pour forth light all around. So if it's good that he's the sun, it's good that the sun's light explode out of the sun. Okay? Now, therefore, to speak more strictly according to truth, we may suppose that a disposition in God as an original property of his nature to an emanation of his own infinite fullness was what excited him to create the world and so that the emanation itself was aimed at by him as a last end of the creation. Now, break that down. He's saying, let's narrow in here. There's a disposition in God. There's an inclination in God. It's a part of his nature. It's not something that he, it's not, uh, this, this inclination is something that exists just because he's God, not because he chooses. Does that make sense? It's original property of his nature, and it's an inclination to overflow, okay? And that's what excited him. Remember earlier I said we need to find the motive and the end? So he's saying this disposition, this inclination of the heart to overflow is the motive. That's what excites him to create the world, and the emanation itself is what was aimed at. There's the end. So now, again, come back to this little diagram. Simple diagram, but 
I think it's helpful. There's a motive in here, and he says it's desire to overflow. And because he desires to overflow, he aims at the overflow of himself, outside of himself. That's the fourth candidate. And you go, okay, I thought we were looking for one thing. How do we have four things? In chapter 1.3, Edwards explores how these four candidates meet that third criteria. Like how do, uh, how does God's, whatever we answer we give, display God's love for himself, his holiness, okay? With the basic question being, if God makes candidate one, two, three, or four his supreme end, then it must also be true that God makes himself his supreme end. That's what chapter 1.3 is going to try to explore. If we've already met, we've got four things that meet criteria two and criteria four. Now we're going to go to criteria three. Can we, do they meet it? If God makes the demonstration of attributes, if he makes knowledge of attributes, if he makes love for attributes, if he makes overflow of fullness, if he makes any of those things his supreme end, is he also showing a love for himself above all things? That's the question Edwards is asking. We'll come back to that question in just a moment, but it's an important clarification at this point that we should make as, uh, as we wrap up this session. Here's the problem. If you say, okay, uh, there's God and he has this inclination to overflow, and so he creates a world, and then therefore you get the overflow over here in creatures. Like you see, you see his attributes and you love his attributes and receive his fullness and all that kind of stuff. Edwards is a little bit, uh, at pains, he's, he's concerned about something. I wonder if you'd be concerned about it. Because that kind of makes it sound like we need to exist first so that God can have somewhere to overflow. Like, we need to be there so that when the fireworks of God's attributes go off, like the display, that we're there to go, ooh, and ah, right? And that's a problem because it makes it sound like we're needed here. And we don't want that. And so he says, I gotta clarify something here. When I talk about overflowing, I don't mean that there must be something to overflow into first. I mean God has a disposition to overflow and therefore he makes creatures to catch it. It's not that there are creatures to catch it and he says, oh, creatures, good, I'll overflow. He says, first, I love to overflow. Therefore, what should I do? I should make some vessels to catch this glory. So in this disposition to diffuse himself, that's overflow. So you see the word diffuse, think overflow to overflow, or to cause an emanation of his glory and fullness, which is prior to the existence of any other being. So this is just God by his Trinitarian lonesomeness and is to be considered as the inciting cause of creation or giving existence to other being. God can't so properly be said to make the creature his end as himself. He's not making us his end like God created the world to overflow into us. He made the world to overflow and therefore he made us. See that? That little shift is massively important so that we don't become necessary for God. The creature is not yet as considered as existing. You're not even in God's mind yet. When he says, I love to overflow, I'm going to overflow, he's not thinking about you yet. Now I get talking about time and God's mind and it gets really weird, okay? Like does God think one thing after another? Does he think in sequence? It's all kind of stuff. But we, this is only what we can think, so this is what we got to go with. When he's thinking, what am I going to do? I'm going to overflow. Therefore, I'm going to make a world. He's not thinking about you first. He's thinking, I love my glory, and I love to overflow. It would be good to overflow. Therefore, because it would be good to overflow, I should make creatures to see it, love it, receive it. It's a disposition that is the original ground of the existence of the creature. Oh, sorry. The disposition or desire in God must be prior to, to the existence of the creature, even in intention and foresight. You're not even a blip in his eye yet. It's just, I love this fullness inside, this fullness of good, this perfections and beauty that are a part of my very nature. I love this so much, I'm gonna overflow out of me. We better make somebody to catch it. It's a disposition that is the original ground of the existence of the creature and uh, even of the future intended and foreseen existence of the creature. In other words, there's two senses of God's love for you or God's love for himself here. There's a general sense. He just loves to overflow in general. And there's a particular sense. He loves to overflow to you 
and the second one is based on the first one. The first one is the original. The second one is consequential. Once you're in the picture, he goes, man, I love to overflow to Shane. But why did he make Shane in the first place? Because he just loves to overflow. It's an original property of his nature. This is who he is. So he gives these two analogies. It's like a tree. When a tree produces fruit, it's not like the tree is aiming for that particular fruit. The tree just has this impulse, this disposition to create fruit and therefore creates that particular fruit. Or the sun doesn't mean to shine on you. The sun just loves to shine and you just happen to be the beneficiary of it. And then Edward says something very, 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 almost blasphemous. This is crazy that he says this, but it's amazing. So we'll end here. So God looks on the communication of himself and the emanation of his infinite glory and good that are in himself to belong to the fullness and completeness of himself. No. Okay, wait, what? I'm saying this. You got God and he's going to overflow and he's going to make this fullness of good, add extra. And he says, God looks at this thing that he creates out of himself, and he says, that belongs to my fullness and completeness. As though he were not in his most complete and glorious state without it. And that's the almost blasphemous part. Right? You see the problem there? I mean, so uh, when you read Edwards, this is a fun little trick you can do. Anytime this little, these, this little phrase shows up, as though, this is called the Edwardsian escape hatch, <laughs> okay? Anytime he wants to say something that's almost heretical, he's just gonna add the words, as though, to say, it's like that, but not really, because if it was really like that, that would be bad, <laughs> and I wouldn't wanna believe it. So it's as though he were in not in his most complete and glorious state. As it's, it's God looks at this overflow and says, that's so much a part of me and what I love that it's like if I didn't have it, I would be incomplete. But I'm not incomplete without it. I'm perfectly fulfilled just with the internal without the external. And you think, okay, wait, what, what does that mean? Well, here's where he's getting this. He's actually getting it from the Bible. This is the only part in chapter one, which is all about what reason teaches, where he pulls out the Bible verses because he knows somebody's gonna read that, like some other like Presbyterian minister is gonna read that as though he were not in his most complete state and is gonna go, wait, what? And so Edwards immediately, right after this, you get Bible verses like, and here's some quotes, just so you know I'm not making this up. Here's what he says. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. It's an amazing verse. I'd never seen this in this passage. I'd, read, I'd probably memorize this verse. Edwards just, but look what he sees. So he's talking about Jesus. God put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So God makes Jesus the head of the church, head of everything, and he gives him to the church. And now here's the key phrase. To the church, which is his body, all good there, explanation, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You ever notice that? What's the fullness here? Well, you work back. There's a comma. The fullness is modifying body. What's his body? That's the church. The church is the fullness of Christ. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can you say that? And Edwards goes, yes, you can say that. Paul says it. I can say it. It's as though Christ was not full unless he had his body, his bride. And I say bride, this is Ephesians, and you can think, oh, I'll jump ahead a little bit. You got the, chap the part about Christ and the church, husbands and wives, okay? And then Edward's mind starts going, and he starts thinking about biblical theology and connections in the Bible, and he says, you know, it's kind of like this. 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. Woman is the glory of man. And he thinks, huh, so, what's woman in Genesis? Well, you have Adam by his lonesome, and then God takes something from inside of Adam, and it comes out, and God builds a woman, and then, God, and then Paul says, that woman, Eve, is the glory of man. That's your glory, Adam. That's the internal thing, the internal part of you coming out, and it's as though, in Adam's case, it's 
because you are not in your most complete and glorious state without her. You need her to be completely fulfilled. And Edwards is going to say, yeah, on analogy with that, it's as though God was not in his most complete state without the church. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. You just think, can you talk that way? Can we talk about the church being the fullness of Christ, the bride being the glory of Christ, Zion, Israel being the glory of God? Can we talk that way? Edwards thought we could because the Bible did. And with that, we'll take a break.